Well, I want to, it's good to see so many family and friends here. Uh, and I, I want to thank Tom Lux for everything that he does for the craft of poetry, both here and at, George, at, at Georgia Tech and in this community. Uh, he's been a great friend. I also want to thank Dr. Clough and Sue Rosser and Dr. Knospel, too, for everything that they do to make this possible. And also for Ginger Murchison, who puts it all together. Um, I had an email from Ginger uh, Murchison Graham, I guess, in and, and the Far East that called my trip short. I was out taking Captain Cook's tour. And um, so I came back for this reading, be at Tech on the 3rd and be prepared to read. Um, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, I really also appreciate these professionals letting an amateur sort of fit in between them. However, I want to warn you that in a couple weeks I'm going pro, and Tom is selling futures on the book, and you better get it now because it's going up. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to read you some poems from the book, um, one from each section, and then I'm going to read you a new poem that I wrote um, while I was out on my trip, but I got to be able to find the poems here first. This is a little bit about what I do, and this is also dedicated to the engineers in the room. This thing is troublesome, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, it's called The Falls of the Mississippi. At Minneapolis, the Corps of Engineers managed to collar and cement in a cement straitjacket the river sandstone cliffs where the Blackfeet believed the Great Spirit once lived. They crossed the falls with arched bridges, cut a canal, threw them with locks, muffled and did away with any mist or roar at all. Along the river's bluffs, halls of old flour mills that made the town's first money await renovation into hotels or demolition. Glass towers defining the modern city are linked by a, a skyway maze that fills with hardy workforce on those cold snap winter days. The buildings have begun to lose their local owners to distant mergers. Like the one with the family's name on it where I worked, where a rogue trader crippled it. They agonized over how to rescue the franchise their grandfather started. A big bank showed up, making it easier to take a profit than save a tradition. At the bottom of the muffled falls, the great river begins its 2,500-mile course to the sea with a mad, muddy boil. And the next one. is uh, called Horace. Actually, Ginger, this was in the Cortland Review. And this is about the hawks that you may have read about in the New York Times where the co-op people took the nest down. This is horrible. You know, I'm, this is, I just got to find this. It was also written before 9-11, about two months before 9-11. Horace. City bird watchers bunch, binocular eyed at the rim of the model boat basin, to watch a reluctant red tailed hawk fledge from a nest high over Fifth Avenue. At first, the nestling tries a tenuous flutter, then he dives and soars into a feathered crossbow. Son of Osiris and Isis. The falcon-faced god of light's effigy crowned Central Park's obelisk, erected in 1600 B.C. in Heliopolis, Heliopolis, excuse me, and given by Egypt to the city of New York in 1906. At home, I rip open mail with a silver horse-headed blade I bought in a Cairo souk, and read about Ramesses' coronation and the assembled court's astonishment when a falcon dove out of the sun to land on the prince's shoulder. The hieroglyph's translation on the obelisk reads, 
the Horus, the strong bull, king of upper and lower Egypt, the chosen of Ra, the golden Horus, mighty in years and great of victories, son of Ra, Ramesses, beloved of Aten, who came forth from the womb to receive the crowns of Ra, lord of the two lands. On a clear storm scrub morning after a run, I stretch under the obelisk, watching Horus incarnate rip the guts from a plump city pigeon atop the Met's roof garden pavilion, screaming the sheer whistle, sheer whistle annunciation of the gods' return. <laughs> 